Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. We're gonna go ahead and get started in just a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for everybody to get connected. So um, we'll get started in about two minutes if you just wanna hang tight. We appreciate you being here. We're just giving everybody one more minute. We'll start at 12.02 um, to get in. So just a second and we'll get started. But thanks so much again for joining us. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, my name is Amanda Garcia, and I am the director of the digital design program here at Tulane. Um, and on the call with us today is Rebecca Carr, Professor Rebecca Carr, and she is one of our professors of practice here. And she and I will be leading the discussion for you today. Um, at the bottom of our screen here is our Instagram and Facebook information. We'll be posting links um, for additional resources after this, as well as a ton of student work, et cetera, that you can view there if you're interested. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Rebecca and she's gonna take us through a quick overall explanation. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about four basic design principles um, that really can help elevate and improve your work. And they're easy to remember because they're can comprise a really fun acronym. So the first one is contrast. The second one is repetition. And the A stands for alignment and the P for proximity. And these, um, these were adapted from a book by Robin Williams um, called the non designers, uh, non designers design book. So it's applicable to designers and non designers. It has, um, you know, explains in depth these uh, principles and it also has lots of other good graphic design tips. So you all should have received a link in your email um, with this little handout that we made for you guys just so you have um, all the terminology. So if not, you can still directly download it um, right here. Okay, so the first principle we're going to talk about is contrast. Contrast is achieved by having elements that are really different. You don't want to have too many similar elements. And the reason we want to do this is because we want certain things to stand out. And hierarchy is what we're trying to achieve. So hierarchy is the order of importance. What's the most important thing on the design? Like, what do you need to see first to know what it's about? And what's the second most important, et cetera, et cetera. So contrast is one of the main ways we can achieve hierarchy. So we can show contrast, and we'll look at examples of all of these through size, texture, isolation, shape, color, subject matter, and location. So in this silly little illustration, okay, you can see on the left, these two guys obviously look very similar, right? The only difference is, is their hair and their little shirt pattern. But on the right, they're, they couldn't be more different. So there's a contrast between them. You would not confuse one for the other. Okay, and this example, um, it's only type, but you can see contrast is achieved by a huge, bold typeface saying tonnage. And not only is it big and bold compared to the other type on the page, but it's also running down vertically. And almost, and the meaning behind this is that it's showing its, its weight pushing the other thin, small type up. Amanda and I are going to jump back and forth. I think her mute's just on. Amanda, it should be unmuted. Okay, got it. Thank you. <laughs> I got to unmute. Sorry about that. So when we're looking at contrast, this is a poster for the Joker. And they're using contrast in many different ways here. So um, what we see is contrast in color. So you'll notice that the word Joker is pulled out in this bright white against this darker very, very dark gray 
uh, I'm sorry, black and dark green background. And so because of what's around it, it has a high contrast to the background. The word Joker also has a high contrast to everything else, all the other typography, because it's kind of a distressed typeface, right? So the typeface itself is very dissimilar to other things around it. And so therefore it has high contrast. Also, you can see just a quick little design tip, and we're gonna give you some of these as kind of we go through. Um, when you are looking up on the poster, the eyes are looking at the Joker typography. And so their eye line um, looking up at the Joker, that is a technique that we use in design quite a bit. So if you have a human figure and they are looking a direction, it's always a really good idea to align the text or typography with where that human is looking. Studies have shown that we actually connect with people's eyes. Um, so if you have a, photogra you know, a photograph or a photographer that you're art directing for an ad, and you know that the person in the ad will be looking a certain direction, make sure that there's enough negative space in that photograph for you to then align typography with that image. Thank you. Okay, so this is another example of contrast with typography. So overlapping two different typefaces here allows enough contrast for this to be very legible. Can everybody see this on the screen? Everyone see the examples? Can I get a thumbs up? Everybody good? Okay. Uh, I know Janelle is having a hard time seeing the samples. Janelle, we're sharing our screen, so I just wanna make sure that um, you're able to see what we're sharing. Um, maybe Sam could kind of help troubleshoot that with her. Okay, so the way that we are experiencing contrast here is a couple of ways, once again, different types, right? And also in color. So we have this red type on top of this lighter gray type. And so that provides a contrast in color. Typically in design, you don't want to overlap text like this, right? Um, and it would be like a big design no-no, but because they're using good contrast, they're sort of able to break some rules because they're doing it really well by using different families um, as well as color. Okay, so on this example, um, which newsletter of these generic newsletters works the best? So the answer secretly is usually always on the right, but the one on the right, because it's using contrast. Okay, so they're, the subheads are big and bold and they are slab serif. They're different from the, the, the overall text, right? And then the, the big headline, the another newsletter is reversed out of black, like Dr. Garcia just talked about. Color can really even negative, positive color, like black and white. If you squint your eyes, you see that big top part first. So that brings us in, okay, it's another newsletter. And then we can navigate more easily because of contrast. In this example, this is the textbook that we use in typography. And in this, this way, contrast is really just used using size. It's a book about type. The whole title is thinking with type, but before we even get to that, we know it's about type and it's large and that's, you know, that's the content. Okay, on this example, which one works better? Again, the one on the right. Um, hierarchy, hierarchy here, everything on the left is around the same size, you know, maybe not exactly, but about the picture, the headline, the uh, title of the, the play is the same size as the time and date information. Whereas on the right, we know the name of the play is on pins and needles. It's large, it's interesting to look at, it's a more dynamic layout, and then we can get to the when and the where. Okay, and this is a student example. We're gonna show some of our students' work in this presentation. This was just a really small exercise in typography, and the students were all given um, just little fun facts, right? Weird but true fun facts. So they could decide what they wanted to emphasize using contrast and hierarchy. And so she wanted to emphasize that this library book was 288 years late. So she's doing this by one, using size, right? It's the biggest thing on, the, on her layout. She's also using color. It's the only thing that's yellow. And she's further doing that by putting it in a big block. So we really see it. This is a beautiful illustration by designer Jessica Hish. If you don't know Jessica, write it down in Google her. She's amazing. Um, she's so good. It makes us all sick to our stomachs. <laughs> Question our role in design. I'm just kidding. 
but she's great. She's great. So Jessica uses all of our design principles perfectly. And this one we thought was a really great example of contrast. So here, let's see all the different ways she's using contrast. Number one, in color. So I know that we talk about color first a lot, and that's because studies show that the human eye is drawn to color. So if you, before you read anything, the eye is drawn to color or look at an image. So if you want to emphasize something, make it stand out using color. So here the word weekend is in white, right? And so obviously that's something that the designer wants us to see first. Then 40 is huge, right? It's also, so size is in contrast. It's also orange. And then that fork kind of leads your eye down the page to the word eats, which is in a blue. So contrasting all, all of these different things with one another, um, the type, the size, the color, and then where everything is positioned on the page creates hierarchy. So the designer is leading your eye through the page using contrast. Notice that weekend is white and then dishes ever, every Washingtonian must try. Those are both white. So your eye will make the connection between those two things. Um, so typically when you're designing something, think about what do I want them to see first, second, third, hierarchy, like Professor Carr said. So when you're leading the people through your page, the user through your page or through your website or through your app or packaging or whatever you're creating, not just a printed page, right? We're gonna look at some 3D examples in a minute. You really wanna consider how can I use these four design principles to kind of instruct my viewer how to read or to view this. Okay, in this next example, um, you know, and a lot of the things we've looked at, the most important thing is near the top. In this example, it's near the bottom, but we know it's the most important, not only because it's larger, but what's the other thing that gives us a clue that the name of this event, Chance of Showers, is the most important. It's the red color, which is contrasting with the kind of dull gray umbrellas. And you can see there's a lot of umbrellas repeating, but it's that one big red pop here that our eye goes to, and then to the name, Chance of Showers. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an example um, by designer Chip Kidd, um, and this is a, a book, and you can notice the contrast here, right? It's this really serious um, serif typeface, it's centered, it all seems like very serious, and then written in marker, like in a real rough hand, is fraud, right? So there's a huge contrast. It's, it's a conceptual thing too, but it's also just like a straight up contrast between the serious and that marker handwritten. Okay, on this um, <laughs> redesign for Target's uh, Market Pantry, which one is using uh, better, better type hierarchy through contrast? It's the one on the right, right? Because we know right away it's cooked shrimp and we can tell what it is before, you know, this one it's all kind of small and about the same size. And so it doesn't work quite as well. Okay, and just to stay on the Target theme. <laughs> on this example, uh, I'll let you guys kind of have a second to think about. What do you see first? What has the most contrast in this piece? There's a lot on this page, but what has the most contrast? And I know everyone's muted, but I'll just answer it for y'all. It's the red color, right? We see the red, we see the Target, the red Target um, logo, we see the lipstick, the kind of glamour here, and then the play on words, less from fabulous. You're gonna get to achieve this look for less. So that's the, um, how contrast is used here. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so hopefully that um, everyone understands contrast and we'll kind of mention it in other designs as we go along. The next principle is repetition. And so repetition is important because it is repeating visual elements and things that are repeated can be shapes, colors, textures, typefaces, um, spatial relationships. And the reason we use, want to use repetition, especially among something with multiple pages, is because it gives us a way to tie everything together, it organizes, it unifies, it tells us where to go when we're looking at something. Okay, so let's dig into some packaging. Um, so typically when you have multiple items, like in a package design or multiple pages, you, or if you're going through a website or an app, you want to make sure that you have elements that are repeating to lead the viewer and to teach the viewer what to expect and what to know as they move through the individual items. So this is a packaging design for AgroCal. 
And you can see how everything is branded similarly. It's very consistent. So consistency is also a way, uh, repetition is a way to con achieve consistency. We hear that word a lot in design. Everything from the color palettes, this like natural wood, the natural paper on the packaging to using just one color, which is black, right? So that's very, very consistent. So they're repeating color. They're repeating shapes. Look at the way the icons are drawn. So all the fun icons within the package is repeated on the wood, on the kind of the, um, the burning in or the stamping of the wood, the branding literally onto the wood, um, as well as the typography. So the typography is very consistent as we move through things. We want to make sure the logo is always the same typeface, you know, if you have a, a branding guide that you're working with with your company, you know how important it is to maintain that consistency with your logo and your branding. So you can see here that they've repeated that on multiple items in a very consistent way. Okay, so on this example, again, Market Pantry, um, it's, you know, if this was on the shelf, there's two different types of butter. And we want to know that they are different, right? So the one's white, one's red. But we also want to know that they're made by the same, you know, they're going to have the same price and they're both made by Market Pantry. So the way that they're doing that, even with them being two different colors, is everything else is treated the same. The way butter is written, um, just the placement of everything else. You know, some minor things differ, but there, it's a, a repetition there, so we know that they go together. Mm -hmm. Now, in publication design, um, Repetition is very important to, to help us navigate. You know, we always know that where we know where to expect the page number. We know where to look because we've seen it on one page and we know where to get to it on another page. Um, it's also, it can be a really um, fun way to repeat um, elements, but in making them look different, right? We, we don't want every page to look the same. Then it would be boring and we wouldn't want to look at it. So here's an example where this is the introductory spread and it's this really cool custom typeface that was made just specifically for the Olympics, right? And so we see it big here on Lindsay Vaughn's name and then we see it repeated in the inside spreads. So this is an app design done by um, one of our students and uh, she wanted to create an app that was kind of a matchmaking app for adoptive animals and uh, potential pet owners. And so it's called Smitten. And many times when you're working through um, apps on your phone, just think about apps that you use every day, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, your banking apps, you know, we're all using, I know I'm using Shipt, uh, like a grocery delivery app. Um, as you move through those pages within the app, there has to be a form of consistency or you would never know where you are. You wouldn't know where to look, right? So think about where the small little icons are within the apps that you use. They're usually always in the same place as you move page through page. Um, and typically, <laughs> typically the logo or the branding is gonna be in the same page and the same place on every single page. Here you can see that this student is actually um, Tamsin Jenkins. And so whenever she designed this app, you notice that the little heart is always in the same location. The color is repeated. Um, the icons are repeated. And the, the way that she's cropping the images, et cetera, is repeated. So that way it's very consistent as users move through the app. So next time you're looking in one of your apps, kind of think about that. This is a menu design by another student named Katie Stern, and it's a beautiful uh, pretend menu project for one of my favorite restaurants, ba uh, Babs, by Water American Bistro. If you haven't been, you should definitely check it out. And so here she is using repetition in color, right? Um, typography. Um, just another quick little design tip. When you hear us talking about typography, we're talking about fonts. And if you're not familiar with that word typography, it's the study of type, right? And the way type is made. And then you can see she's using what we call two different type families. So you may have heard us reference this previously, but this is another little design uh, term and lingo. When we're talking about type families, that is, um, you can think of it as you are a particular member of your family. You're one person within your larger family, right? So for example, the cheese and charcuterie, that is, a specific, um, that's probably Bedoni, right, which is an overall type family, be Bedoni regular or Bedoni italic. Those are type 
spaces within the family. So when you're referring to design um, and you're talking about the overall type family, so I could say she's using two type families here. And then within that, I could say, I like the type face you're using for Bywater American Bistro, because that's one face within that overall Fairwater script is the name of that type face, that type family. So anyway, she's using two different type families here, which gives really great repetition. So she's keeping those consistent as she moves through. Also her illustrations, they're all very similar in the way that she's created these illustrations. So that includes more repetition. Her alignments, the way she's aligning things, she's using repetition. So um, good contrast, the way she's using contrast is repeated. So you can use these different terms together to create really beautiful, consistent work. And here's another look um, at an earlier edition of the, the book jacket designed by Chip Kid Fraud. And I just wanted to show that, you know, on a three-dimensional item or something where you turn the page, you want to see the same thing more than once, just so you know that it belongs together. So this is a really nice way that he's repeating the hand, the marker look on the spine and on the back. Um, if we just saw the spine of this, we'd know that this was the book. We'd recognize it. Okay, also the element of repetition can be used between in type and an image. As you can see here on the on the right, the marionette has these strings, you know, that are holding it, holding her up and that they're using that same treatment on the type, not just with the lines, but also the, the movement of it. And this example um, is also using the, the overall image repeating with the type and this, these really bright, fun colors of these ribbon hands are being repeated down here in the type. This is a, another um, one of our students. This is Nicole McCon, and this was a, um, a project that she did for a service learning um, client here in town, a local client, the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. And so this was for an event called Celebration, and the, hers was the one that they ended up choosing and using, and we were really excited about it. So she ended up coming up with a solution for this design where she hand lettered and hand painted this piece of slate to you know, mark this celebration. And I just wanna show you that within a overall project, there's ways that repetition can be used, even if it's something as simple as a email signature. So she's obviously repeating the same treatment here on this postcard, this, this little, you know, thanks for coming kind of postcard. And then also just in the promotion of something as simple as an email signature, she's repeating that same treatment, but it looks a little bit different, but we know it's all the same, same thing. So this is a project by a um, student that just recently graduated, Lauren Andres, and this is for the Paris Style Cafe. So this is a pretend cafe in City Park. And you can see that how, once again, on multiple pieces, she's using a similar imagery style, even though it's not exactly the same, it feels very consistent. She's using a similar color palette. So she's repeating the color in the forks, knives, and spoons. She hand painted the lids of the coffee cups. So this is all handmade from her. Um, she's using this purpley gray color throughout. She is also using repetition and logo placement and how the logo is um, treated. And so once again, multiple pieces using repetition um, creates overall consistency. And then this is some um, chocolate packaging. It looks really yummy. And and you can see how they have many different packages for this chocolate line, but how they are using good repetition in the style of the imagery, the way that they're treating the color. So even though the colors themselves do not repeat necessarily, it's the way that they're treating the color blocking and the placement on the page that is repetitive. Also noticing down kind of toward the bottom where they're talking about the size of the bar, they have the pretty little droplet with the color that's in the same place every single time. The logo is treated the same. So if you were to see these on a shelf, you would know that it's under the same branding, even though each one has their own color palette. Um, here's another uh, publication design example. This was actually done by one of our students, Lauren DeBot. And you can see she has a few things that are repeated here. Um, you see this little pattern that she's got in the background. It's kind of like the wallpaper behind this really nice hand done lettering that she did. And we see it again in the corner, the, the style of the, the I guess, 
<laughs> instruments of <laughs> the killers are also, yeah, <laughs> also repeated. Um, and of course, she's repeating type families. You know, you can really recognize this one with the, the real curly elements to it that she repeats, you know, on important headings and the starting point. So this is another um, packaging design. So once again, we're repeating an overall feel. So we don't want you to think that repetition has to be exactly the same, right? But if you have certain elements that repeat, that will add really great consistency. So the caps on these are all bright gold, even though the patterns are wildly different for each, there is an overall consistency that makes this feel like one unit, um, as well as logo placement and logo treatment. Um, this example was done by another one of our students, Hannah Gregory, and this was, she designed this logo for a fictional um, restaurant. And she also has these really nice illustrations that we see repeated in different ways through all of the different pieces. You see, you can see the, you know, they make up this nice pattern on the menu. They also show, serve to kind of illustrate what the different things on the menu are. And then on the website, it's there, you still see them, but they're a little different. Some of them are colored, some aren't, and even on the um, food packaging. Okay, so this is a set of icons by one of our students, Megan Calvin, um, and she created this set of icons um, uh, around an overall theme. And so what you can see here is that the color palette is repeated, her line weight, so even though each of these is different, the line weight is consistent. So this is what we call mono line. So you can see, for example, the one kind of in the middle uh, next to the cupcake, the one with the little plus sign in the center, you can see that the circle is the same weight as the outline around the plus sign, right? So you can see that she's using line weight for consistency, consistent color palette overall, and consistent style in which she's drawn these icons. Um, this is another piece of packaging. Um, so once again, very consistent. This is like a gift set. So very consistent, um, even within the gift set itself of the way the color is used, texture is used within the packaging and placement of the icons and text. And this example, I just wanted to, to show that, you know, sometimes the actual type itself can repeat what is happening in the visual. So you can see these really cool rolls of paper are repeated in the style of the custom type that is made here. Okay, and moving on to RA in our acronym is alignment. So alignment is the visual connection from one element um, to another on a page. So nothing should ever just be randomly placed. That doesn't mean pieces of design can't have a lot of energy and fun. It just means that everything should have some connection to each other. And so alignment is, is achieved by having an invisible line, invisible horizontal or vertical lines that connect one thing to another. So do you want to talk about this from your class, Rebecca? Sure. So this was done um, in typography two by student Kathy Hume. Um, and she's, she created this, you know, she handed this type here and she did this really nice job on this piece. Um, so alignment is used, you know, there's text alignment in that the type goes from one side to the other. We know how to, we know how to move through it, again, because the principle of repetition, we know where to start each subsection. Um, but everything is connected to each other, you know, like we can see where this starts and stops as it relates to the type here. Um, and then I'm, again, showing this example. Um, I'm repeating them just to show that these principles can you know multiple principles happen in one piece of design so here this we actually do see just because they're trying to illustrate type principles there is a line that's going from along the p but you can see if you imagine drawing a longer uh vertical line you see that everything is lined up with that p you see how the ellen lupton name the thinking with type and even the bottom part a critical guy all lines up with that p okay and then back to the library books so in this case um, you can see the 288 is not just kind of even randomly placed there. It lines up the edge of the K and the was lines up with the 288. Okay, and then the box is, is goes above it 
but it still looks visually like everything lines up. And I just wanna also say that the invisible lines don't necessarily have to be only horizontal and vertical. Like in this example, diagonals really draw our eye in. If we wanna, if we wanna get a viewer's attention, attention, a diagonal is a good way to, to, to get that. So in this student example, um, recycle it is gonna be like the founding point that things are aligned with, right? So that's at a horizontal line, but everything is pulling, aligning to that. So um, this is a book cover, again, by designer Chip Kidd. You guys probably recognize this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to talk about things being aligned to visual interest, right? So like Professor Carr just mentioned, with Recycle It being the anchoring point, you have to think about what is the anchoring point for any piece. So we talked earlier about if you have photography and you have somebody's eye line, if they're looking a certain direction, I'd want to align the type with that. Um, and or if you don't have a physical person and you have a figure like this, um, we have this T-Rex. What is the most interesting part of this? Well, it's probably the teeth and the claws. <laughs> so you can see that Michael Crichton's name is aligned with the claws, right? Of, of is this the T-Rex, right? The T-Rex, I think. I think so. <laughs> um, the claws are aligned with, the, um, with his name. Uh, and then also the title. Once again, it doesn't seem like things are aligned on a necessary, like a per perfect grid, which is okay. We want to make the point that everything doesn't have to be in rigid columns. Things must relate to one another on the page um, and align to what makes sense. So because he only had the words Jurassic Park, the T-Rex, and Michael Crichton on this cover, you know, Chip had to make certain uh, decisions, right? If we want the figure to be very large, what is important about the figure that then we can align to? So that's, we just want to make the point that things don't have to be in a perfect grid all the time. Okay, here is another student example. Um, this was an exercise um, where they were dealing with an interview. And you can see how alignment is used here um, to help us figure out what's the question and what's the answer. So all of the questions align with each other and then all of the answers align with each other and then just as a quick way to review all of the principles you know she's using contrast the 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 title for the interview is large and we know that it's about typography because it's in that you know red uh color mm -hmm. um and then she's she's also using um repetition we know to navigate in between each which one's the question because it's repeated the same way and same with the answer. Okay, so this is an infographic. So infographics are huge um, within our profession. And so uh, this is a infographic on how to make a cake and other desserts, right? And so alignment when you have this much information is critically important. So it's very, very critical that things that relate to one another are aligned with one another. Things that are unrelated to one another are, are separated visually in some way. So if we zoom into this, I think on the next slide, um, you can see how each, even though this is almost kind of in like a dome shape, right? Kind of like an askewed um, uh, asymmetric um, or isometric illustration, you can see how the decoration section over on the right, those are actually aligned in columns. And then the overall like making process on the left, those are aligned in a, a separate set of columns and grid. So when you have a ton of information like this, just remember alignment is one way to make it very easy for your viewer to read. Um, so when we're looking at packaging, so you may have seen this at your favorite grocer, um, mm -hmm. but in packaging, you can have a lot of fun with alignment. And so this is one way uh, that you can actually align different products to one another. So these images obviously complete themselves around the, the bottles, right? But if you turn them just right and for merchandising sake, align them like this on a shelf, you get one image. So think about it if you're working on packaging or if you have like a series of posters or anything like that that you're working with, think about how you can have fun with alignment to add more to the story. And then once again, back to our menu. Alignment, once again, with so much information, right? Alignment is a way to add consistency and make it easy for your viewer to understand what they're reading. 
Um, so this is another set of packaging for tea. So when we're thinking about alignment here, and we could have really done anything with this package design, right? Um, but when we're thinking about alignment, the title and the description are very easily aligned. And then we see that we're using this beautiful photography center aligned on the overall page um, in a very um, non-distracting way to everything else that needs to be said. So this is a lot of info. Um, about these different T uh, sticks is what they're called. And so in order to make it easy to understand, they've used really great alignment and contrast. Um, and once again, shelf presence will be really beautiful here when you line them up. All the colors in the top half will align on the shelf. All the images will align against the bottom on the shelf as well. Okay, so that brings us to our last um, acronym, our letter in our acronym, proximity. And this one is probably um, the most confusing, difficult to understand, but it's in some ways the simplest in that all it's really talking about is the idea of grouping items that relate to each other, right? So when, when items are close to each other, you, they can kind of become one visual unit rather than separate. And so, you know, for example, a product photo, the price, the description are all together. So we know that they, they belong together. So it helps us again, like repetition, it helps us organize information and give structure. So in this, um, another target circular, you can see that the, the picture of the product, the, the bottles and the price and their description are all grouped together. We know that this price and this description relates to the bottle above it just like this one relates to the formula. And this here relates to the shoe because it's all grouped together. And they, you know, they are able to do this in a really balanced way. We feel like this is a surface. And, but yet, they're still taking this ton of information and keeping the things that relate to each other together. So here's another um, menu example from Reginelli's. Um, it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, we have to navigate a menu when we're trying to figure out what we want to order, right? So obviously the grouping of all appetizers, all the appetizers are together in one column. I know this seems like really basic, but it, it is important in design when you are sometimes given a bunch of text that doesn't quite make sense together until you put it together. You put it in, um, in groupings. All the salads are together. And then even within the individual um, listings, you know, the the name of the item, the description, and the price are all grouped together. This is a really um, fun example where the, you know, it's just one large image, but to break it apart, the white coat, the type about the white coat is placed right next to the coat, the number is placed near it, and then the description. And then you know, they're doing really fun, interesting things. So we want to look at the whole piece, but if we really want to get the individual information, it's grouped together. It's in proximity of each other. So again, I'm going to repeat this. Remember, it's, our, it's the color and the, the contrast that brings us down, but the information that we need to read is together. We need to know who's presenting it. We need to know the when and the where, the date information, that's all together. And notice that the date information is the only other thing that's in red. You know, that's, they want us to know when it is because we can't go if we don't know when and where it is, right? So the important information grouped together. So this is a beautiful illustration by student Lauren DeBot. And um, once again, it's a poster. If you wanna go to the next slide, you can see the full poster. But um, she's done this really great illustration for the Mofalata Festival out in um, Metairie. And uh, in order for it to make sense with all of this great typography that she's created, she used proximity in a way to make it dynamic uh, and then group things that are similar. So once again, she had ingredients for the Mofalata over on the right side, using good contrast for color, good alignment, also proximity those elements together and then over on the left hand side same thing using great proximity um, to to group together the information but I will also say that when we think about hierarchy again the number one thing you probably saw whenever we came to this slide was the sandwich illustration it's centered it's the largest thing on the page right you're trying to discern all the different little uh, ingredients for the sandwich so she is using proximity to that subject which is the sandwich, right? Just like think about our T-Rex. We're using proximity 
of that, uh, that focal point to place our most important elements, which is the, obviously, what she deems most important <laughs> are the ingredients and the time and place. Um, so this is another beautiful piece of wine um, packaging. And so when we're thinking about all of our design, our CRAP here, we're using really great contrast in color, um, you know, repeating uh, these, the color repeating the alignment here that we have for the Psalm all the way down to the 750 mLs. But then we're also kind of pushing apart the story, the handwriting over on the left, that's all in proximity to it. Itself. It's not interspersed and mixed with the information about the wine, right? That would be a lot of information to take in when you're trying to buy wine. So when you think about what you're designing, think about where uh, the, the customer will be interacting with it, right? Especially if it's digital, like a web or app, you really need to make sure that your information and the proximity of that information to one another is organized in a way that's very easy for your user to find. Because at the end of the day, Design is all about visual communication, right? And if it takes too long for your end user to understand what you're trying to communicate, you've not done your job. So proximity here, pulling apart that story and pulling apart the information about the wine is very well done in a way that makes it easy to understand. Um, this is a poster for A Star Is Born. Uh, we're probably all familiar with this. And looking at proximity, although it employs, once again, all four of the principles that we talked about. When we really think about proximity though, let's start with the first question you always ask yourself, right, is what is my focal point? So I'm gonna give you a second to think about what's the focal point here? What have we talked about? If you wanna put it in the chat, feel free. So what is the focal point? What do we see? What are we drawn to first, based on everything we talked about? Anybody remember? We're drawn to this. That's right. The eyes. Yes. You saw the title, the couple. Okay, good. So, you know, what we've learned is that um, when people, when we humans were first drawn to their faces and then specifically to their eyes. So I would, you know, say that we're probably drawn to their gaze first, that visual connection, right? Um, the image is in black and white. In theaters, October 5th is in black and white. Their names are in black and white. But then in this, this way to sort of bring out, add contrast and in separate proximity is the title, which is in this gold, right? So once we look at the figures, then we see how the B connects to Bradley Cooper's beautiful head. And that brings us up into the title of A Star is Born in that gold. So you can see how they're sort of like stacking the text using really beautiful alignment, the proximity of the image, the focal point to the text how your eyes sort of led down to the image. They're using really, really great proximity uh, in that way. And then um, we also wanted to show an example of how you can just break all the rules, right? So um, if you're not familiar with um, James Victory, it's V-I-C-T-O-R-E, Google him. Uh, he does live uh, broadcast every day at two o'clock from his Instagram account as well. And he talks about some of his books. So we would definitely recommend you checking that out. And this poster is free for you guys to download. We'll talk about it in a second. But he took his overall concept and he said, we want, this is a poster he did for us uh, that we commissioned him to do on, because our school of SOPA, we have traditional students. We also have non-traditional students that are working adults or professionals that are either getting a second degree or they're looking to enhance. Like if they're a designer, they may want web skills. If they're in PR, they may want design skills, et cetera. So he's playing off of this, this quote, we are all born wildly creative, right? And so idea that, uh, I think that's from the book Letters from a Young Poet which is also a great book you should check out. Um, and so he created this poster based on that idea that we're all creative from the time of birth when we were drawing with crayons to today. And so he's literally breaking all the rules, right? He's overlapping colors in a way that are visually appealing. Sometimes they have low contrast, sometimes they have high contrast. He's repeating a style. So even though it looks like he's not really using repetition, he's definitely repeating the way the letter forms and the way that the color is used. Um, alignment, when we think about alignment, you know, he's not really aligning much here at all, but it definitely brings your eye down, using that figure to bring your eye down um, through the page. And then of course, proximity of one element to another. So he's kind of breaking all the rules and using them at the same time. 
And I'll real quick, um, I see a question in the, in the chat from Julie um, asking, in general, when designing, when designing something, how often do you get feedback from somebody else to make sure it makes sense? And that's a really good question. Um, you know, in, in our classroom setting, we definitely try to do that. We have what's called critiques and we show the work and then we get feedback from the class and from the, from the professor. When you're like a freelance designer or when working uh, by yourself, it's always good to get feedback, even from someone who is not in the design field. If you're trying to convey a message, you know, ask, ask someone who has, you know, is an engineer or does something completely different. And if they get it, then it's gonna, it's gonna make sense to everybody. But yeah, it, I think you never get too old to get feedback on your design. It always helps everyone. Um, so it's, yeah, a good practice to do it when you can, for sure. That was a great question. Um, okay. Um, Dr. Garcia, you wanna end this one just by sure. reviewing our acronym? Absolutely. So our, our CREP, Contrast, Repetition, Alignment, Proximity, you should really be using all of these together in your design, right? So we yeah. broke them out today, but as you can see, any good design is going to employ all four of these tactics, among other things, right? But these we feel are four great tactics that you can use um, to enhance your overall design and um, like I said, and like, like Professor Carr said, we have that handout for you. Um, it's just off of our website. And um, I believe it's, our website is just digitaldesign.tulane.edu. And I think it's forward slash CRAP. And that should get you to the handout, to the download. They just kind of gives you some pointers to keep in mind as you're going through things. And as you're designing, you know, like when you feel like you're finishing up, I, it, sometimes I'll still do this. You know, I go through and I say, okay, am I getting all of my, four principles. Do I have my C, my R, my A, and my, and my P? And it's good to kind of just check yourself and go through these. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, this is our website once again, and um, feel free to check us out. So there's the poster. You can download that James Victoria poster we just talked about. It's just our website forward slash poster and or the handout is just our website forward slash handout. And um, I encourage you to check out our website have some more of these land apps coming up. Um, a couple of them, I'm just going to go there right now and check out the next one to tell you, make sure I tell you the right one. Um, coming up, we do have typography. So we talked a lot about typography today. We have one exclusively on type and type rules, things that you may not even like know that you don't know on type rules that will really help enhance your work. So I would highly encourage you to come to that one. We're also going to talk about those little key terms like serif, sans serif, you know, how to use those different faces for hierarchy, et cetera. And then right after that, um, Professor Samantha Barnes is on here today. We're going to be doing Adobe XD basics, which is going to be super fun. And so if you've ever wondered how to do a prototype of an app or a website, uh, Adobe XD is a great piece of software. It's super, super awesome. Drag and drop. We're going to use some templated pieces to make it really easy for you. So that way you can kind of get in and, um, and have fun with it. So um, I'm getting a question on the chat. Does our office offer services? Yes, absolutely. So we have um, a couple of ways if you're interested in engaging with some of us or our students. We have um, service learning projects. So if it's a nonprofit or uh, for a cause, sometimes we can incorporate it into a class for projects. Um, but then we also have something called our co-op. So if you go to our website, you can find more information on our, our co-op. And basically it's a hand-picked group of students every different semester. And um, you basically pay a very small fee and you're, where our students are paid and our faculty are, are compensated to then provide full campaigns and services for you. So that's under our um, website. If you click on sponsored projects, uh, or just digitaldesign.tulane.edu forward slash C-O-O-P. So it looks like COOP, but it's co-op. Um, and that'll give you more info on that. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate it. Feel free once again to reach out to Professor Carr or I if you have any questions. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Have a good day.